You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. The idea of the golden thread is, is, I guess, what Uncle Matt, I like to call a big picture idea. It's, it's, it's big ideas and themes that go all the way from one end of the Bible through to the other. And what we find when we look from Genesis to Revelation is we find that there are, I guess, two sides, two opposing battles that are working their way out. And it really it comes down to our pride, our stubbornness. And, and the things that we want to do to please ourselves, and how those characteristics manifest themselves in people, in groups of people, in whole countries. But then on the other hand, there's the part of us that likes to worship God, that, that likes to tell the truth, that likes to do good, that likes to show love and mercy, all of godly characteristics. And then there's the individuals, the people and the the groups of people and the the, the nations that have actually aspired to those godly principles and those godly values. So in Genesis chapter 3.15, when the first sin ever is committed by Adam and Eve, God provides them a way out and he says, I'm going to give you a son, a seed, and he's going to be the one that overcomes the thinking that leads to people doing whatever they want to do. And as we go through the Bible, we see that there's this Two opposing groups. There's the seed of the serpent, Cain, who killed his brother Abel, who sets up a city and makes himself a big man. And then on the other hand, you have Enoch. And they're the people that wanted to call themselves after the name of God. So we are God's people. We are godly people. That's what they aspire to. In Noah's day, we've got the sons of God. They see the daughters of men and there's this mingling of values this compromise going on, and then suddenly the truth becomes blurred and we, we end up losing people right the way down to one family. And of course, Noah had to build a boat and God started all over again. And then no sooner do we get out of the ark that Ham is clearly somebody who doesn't quite share his father's values. And so the seed of the serpent carries on again. And we get Nimrod We get the Tower of Babel. People wanted to make a name for themselves, to build a tower that reaches up to heaven. It's like, you're not going to flood us anymore. We're going to be on the top of our little tower. And so then on the other hand, you've got Abraham, and you've got his family, and how he's called out of Ur of the Chaldees. And so we have the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, the family of God, the children of men. And then in Daniel, we get this great conflict between Israel, which was the kingdom of God at that stage, and the kingdoms of men, Babylon, Greece, Persia, Rome. And at the end in Revelation, when all of this wraps up, we have the kingdom of God, or the kingdoms of this world, merge into the kingdom of God, and God overcomes everything, and Jesus Christ reigns as king. And so this is really the big, big Bible picture, big Bible idea. And when Jesus talks about one of his parables, And he says, the king, which is Jesus, shall say to them on the right hand, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. So the kingdom of God is something that's been prepared by God right the way back before God even created the world. He had a plan to have a kingdom, to have Jesus as king to have a lamb slain. All of us sitting here are chosen from the foundation of the world. So these are some of the big ideas, the golden thread. So now we get down to, well, what is this promise to David? Well, it's a fairly big idea in the Bible as well. If we just look at the New Testament alone, and you can write this in your Bible, if you like, in 2 Samuel 7, in the New Testament, Abraham is mentioned 73 times, David is mentioned 59 times, and the promises to both are mentioned about 61 times, alluded to or directly mentioned in the New Testament. So what God promised David is quite important. Right? So what did God promise David? What are some of these golden threads that work their way through? Well, here is something that um, I drew. 
And here are some of the, the dominant themes that find their way. So in the promises made to Eden, we have a promised son that was going to be born of a woman that was going to overcome the thinking that led to sin and death. Now, remember when Eve gave birth to Cain in Genesis chapter 4. Now, we know there's no man involved. Mary, when she gave birth to Christ, there was no man involved. God sent forth his son born of a woman. There was no man. So when Eve gives birth to Cain, she says, I've gotten me a man from God. And poor old Adam's not even mentioned. Now, it's the first baby that's been born on the world. You'd say, darling, look what we've made together. But no, I've gotten me a man from God. You think, why does she say that? Well, clearly, Adam and Eve probably thought Cain was it. First baby, oh, this is the scene. Okay, I've got a baby from God. Okay, this must be it. Now, was Cain the seed of the woman? No, he wasn't. He was the seed of the serpent, so not quite. So Adam and Eve had to realise that this isn't going to happen immediately. In fact, this isn't going to happen in our lifetime, that this is going to happen a long, 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 long time into the future. And so Luke, when Luke records the genealogy of Jesus, he goes all the way back to David, all the way back to Abraham, and then all the way back to Adam to show that the seed of the woman went all the way through back to Adam and Eve. Now, last week, we looked at Samson at our camp. And what do you think Samson's mother thought when she couldn't have a baby? An angel comes along and the angel says, you're going to have a special son. What do you think she thought? Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the promised seed. And he kind of was a promised seed, but he wasn't the promised seed. Now, who else? What other mothers would have felt that? They needed God to intervene to help them have a son, and the son was going to be a special son. What other mothers? Come. Sarah. Hannah, Samuel, right? Sarah with Isaac, Rebecca was actually barren as well. Noah's wife, when you look at how old he was when he had those children, it seemed that he was barren as well. Well, she was barren, well, he was barren. All men are barren. <laughs> so the point is. That was the promise, that was their gospel message, that there was going to be a woman who was going to bring forth a special boy, and that boy was going to do great things. And what you find in the pagan world is they got this idea and they said, right, a woman gives birth to God, and God becomes, so Baal and Ashtoreth were just basically a, 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 a husband um, wife God and they gave birth to other gods and so you find there's a distortion and, and a lot of these pagan ideas all came out of this idea of a woman giving birth to a special son. When we come to Abraham we have more information, it's like God's mind map. So in Adam and Eve we have the seed, foot of a woman, sin and death, very simple ideas. Abraham we get a lot more information, right? We have a nation, a family, we have a land, arise, walk through the land, through the length and the breadth of it, to you will I give it and your family forever. We have blessings for the whole world, not just Jews and Gentiles. We have one particular seed in Genesis chapter 22, where he says, after offering up Isaac and, and God stopped him, and he said to Abraham, well, there's going to be one particular seed that's going to possess the gates of your enemy. And Paul, when he reads that, he says, that's not talking about lots of children. God is honing in on one particular son, the son that would overcome sin and death. So you can see Adam and Eve were promised a son. Abraham was promised a son. And now we come along to the promises made to David. Now, before we go to Samuel 7, I want you to come with me to Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1... We have Mary when she was promised to have a special son. Again, a virgin, no man involved. God is going to intervene to save the human race because humans simply can't do it. Right? So here's Mary, young lady, never married, and suddenly an angel appears to her. What was the angel's name, children? Who? Who said Michael? wasn't Michael, it was the angel Gabriel, right? Your father will address this after the talk. <laughs> right, so the angel Gabriel comes along and marries this young lady engaged to be married to Joseph 
and we read from verse 28. And he came to her and says, Greetings, O favoured one, God is with you. And she was greatly troubled, as you would if an angel appeared to you. I mean, I'm scared enough as the dark. Imagine if you're in the dark and an angel suddenly appeared. It'd be horrifying, right? So she says, um, what is this all about? And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, because you have found favour with God. And she said, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you're going to call himself Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? My son at school, we covered this. Jesus, Yahshua, God shall save. Thank you. Close enough. All right. He will be great. He will be called the Son of God. Right. And God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Now, if you have your coloured pencils, these are the things that we should be highlighting in our pre love Bible because they're the key ideas that relate back to the promises that have been made to David. He's going to be great. He's going to be the son of God. And God is going to give to him what? The... It's up on the screen. Children, you can yell this out if you like. Yes? A throne. Well done. All right. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, that is important because in the promises to Eden, there's no kingdom mentioned at all, just a child, sin and death. Promises to Abraham, there's not a kingdom either. A land, a family, a nation, a seed, no kingdom. The promises to David is the first mention of a kingdom where there's going to be a king reigning over Israel. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary, of course, is a virgin. So again, we've got Genesis 3.15. There's not going to be a man involved here. God is going to intervene to save humans because humans cannot save themselves. So this is really why the promises to David are so important because the angel Gabriel, when introducing Jesus to the world, references the throne of David. So we're going to go back to... Now, if you highlighted all of those passages in your... In your um, pre-loved Bibles, we'll go back to 2 Samuel 7, and I'm going to look at a little bit of a context that leads up to the promises to Abraham, uh, no, to David, where David was in his kingdom. Now, can somebody tell me, and this is a trick question because I didn't know the answer, well, I thought I knew the answer and I was right, but I wasn't absolutely sure. What was the first battle David ever fought when he became king over united Israel? What, what was the first battle he fought? He took a city, a particular city. Aha. Uh -huh. So number one battle, David is king. He's now united. All of Israel's with him and he goes, battle number one. I want that city. Right, you remember, Joab's in disgrace, right, because he's a brutal, nasty murderer. David sort of sacked him. And he makes this promise, whoever gets that city and takes it, by climbing on into the little water channel, right? The Hezekiah made to a very long channel, but there was a very narrow water channel. Whoever gets into the city and opens up the door so we can all run in, he is going to be the captain of my army. And so the recently sacked Joab goes, thank you, I'm going to get my job back. And that's exactly what he did. Joab got sacked twice and he always wound his way back, right? A very ambitious political man. But the first battle that David fought was to get Jerusalem. He wanted Jerusalem. He knew Jerusalem was important. How did David know Jerusalem was going to be an important place? So what's some passages that maybe give him an indication that Jerusalem was going to be an important place? Sorry? Yeah, but it doesn't say Jerusalem. But it says God's chosen a place. So there's a place that's chosen of God, but it doesn't say what. But David's figured out it's Jerusalem. How has he figured this out? Now, how do we know he's figured it out? He's actually figured this out well in advance. There's something David did, a heroic thing, where Jerusalem was in his mind. What did he do? He took Goliath's head to Mount Moriah, in Jerusalem, all right, that was just outside of Jerusalem. 
So he cuts off the head of this great big giant, sixes all over the place, the, the, a giant of the flesh that was terrifying the kingdom. They needed a saviour, they needed someone to stand up. David does the job of whacks it in the head, Genesis 3.15, with a stone. He cuts off the head. He then carries that head about 40-odd kilometres to Jerusalem. That's a, a long time to carry a head. And anyone who saw him said, that man's trying to get a head. Sorry, that was a very bad joke. But he knew Mount Moriah was important and it was going to be a place that God would achieve something. How did he know that? That Mount Moriah was critical, that there was going to be a place where, where something important was going to happen. How did he know that? Come on, people. Mount Moriah. Abraham offered Isaac at Mount Moriah. And it was called Yahweh Jira, which means... God will provide. In this place, God will provide. So David, sitting out there with his sheep, thinking about the Bible and all these things, had figured out. Now there's one more passage that tells you that David knew. David knew that there was something special about this place. What other passage in Genesis? Starts, yes, I was going to say, starts with a mel and ends with a kizadek. All right, Melchizedek, what was so special about him? He was a king and a priest. How many king priests after Melchizedek are mentioned in the Bible? Apart from Jesus. Zero. There were none. Right? So special. Somebody was the, had the ability to balance mercy and truth in a way that allowed him to be a king priest. And he blessed Abraham. And of course, as Paul says, someone more important will always bless somebody less important. So if my children go, bless you, Father, I'm like, so what? I give you all of your food. What, what does your blessing count for me? I bless you. I have the money. I have the control. You're my child. So Paul says the greater is the blessed of the lesser. No, the lesser is blessed of the greater. And so Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And David have figured out, right, so... Jerusalem, the king of Salem, the king of peace, a king and a priest, offering bread and wine, Mount Moriah. God will provide. And David, out there in the sheep, had worked out it's got to be Jerusalem. And so then he takes Jerusalem. And now what does he do? First thing when he's got Jerusalem, he says, right, where's the ark? Where's the ark? It's in this place because, remember, the Philistines took it. So he says, right, we've got to get the ark and we've got to get it back to Jerusalem. That's where the ark belongs. This is the place. I'm certain of it. So full of good intentions, he goes and gets the ark, sticks it on a cart, and what happens? Band's playing, ark's on a cart, Jason David's all happy. What happens? Cart hits a thing. All right, poor old Uzzah goes... Splat, dies, the music stops. <laughs> Everyone's just like, oh my goodness, what are we supposed to do? David's really upset. He's just thinking, well, I had great intentions. That should be enough. Right? So he goes back to the drawing board, figures out what's supposed to happen. They'd forgotten. They didn't know. They'd forgotten their Bible. It'd be like Hezekiah's day. They'd forgotten the Bible. So then he thinks, right, the priest has got to carry it. He's got to do it right. So <laughs> get the whole thing going again. And then they're like, right, I think we're all good. Yep, yep. Okay, walk a few steps. Dum, 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 dum. Nothing's happening. Nope. And he's just like, yes. <laughs> and so the music starts up again. And, and in they go into Jerusalem. Now, not only did God allow David to, to, to do this, but what did God also allow David to do? He wore, as he danced into Jerusalem, what? Maybe kiddies don't remember. Adults might have to help. He wore a priestly garment. Right, which was an ephod. And what else did he do that indicated that he, for a brief period, was able to play the role of a king and a priest? What did he do? He offered, he offered the peace offerings and he gave the people bread and wine, just like Melchizedek. So he, as a king and a priest, is basically offering offerings and giving bread and wine to the people, just like Melchizedek did. Now, what do you think David's perhaps thinking at this present moment in time? Well, maybe this is it, like the apostles. Maybe this is the kingdom. Maybe it's all going to go from here. Maybe I'm the one. So he thinks, right, the temple. Let's build a temple. And he's full of high hopes. Now, we know everyone was thrilled and excited. And everyone was just on this absolute high because what did Nathan say? 
when David, David said he was going to do it? What did Nathan say? What was his advice? Sorry? Go and do it. Great idea. Let's get the kingdom going. Let's get the kingdom started. This is going to happen on your reign. This is amazing. We are now on the verge of the kingdom of God. Right? There was so much excitement. And so Nathan said, well, hey, I'm a prophet. Yep, good. Sounds great. Let's sign off. Off you go. Nathan goes home and suddenly realises that, no, no, this isn't going to happen quite now. And no, David, you're part of the process, but you're not the whole process because you're going to die. And this boy that comes along, he's going to be the one that finishes up after you're dead. Right? So it's a little bit like Abraham where God had to tell him, well, you're actually not going to see the land. In fact, you're going to die. You're not going to see the land. And your children are going to get the land about 450 years later. Or Daniel where he's asking all these questions like what, where, how, when. And, and the angel says, it's all right, Daniel. You're going to die. You'll see, but you'll be there. Don't worry. You'll stand in your lot. So, like us, all these people, like, they lived their lives and things came together and like, maybe this is the place. Maybe I'm the special mother. Maybe I'm the promised seed. Maybe. But at certain points, God had to step in and go, not quite. And, of course, here all we are in this room. And, of course, we're looking at the world and going, surely, surely it doesn't get any crazier than this. Surely the world has reached peak stupidity <laughs> And God's just got to stop this nonsense. But maybe not. Maybe it'll be our children. And that's why we have to work so hard on them to make sure that their minds are with God and not being sucked into the world. So the promises to... Anyway, we've covered all of this. So these are all the passages that talk about um, the, the background, the lead-up, the battles, and Jerusalem. So if you want to write that in, that Jerusalem as a special place... Well, basically, the promised seed is in Genesis 3.15, but then Genesis 14, Melchizedek, Genesis 22, Mount Moriah, Samuel 17, Mount Moriah, and then the taking of Jerusalem to show that David understood that Jerusalem was a special place. So we read in 2 Samuel 7 what the promises to David were, and we'll just basically refresh that. So when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your father, so David, not now, you're going to die. I'm going to raise up your offspring afterwards and he will come from your body and I'll establish his kingdom. Now Solomon did fulfill this, didn't he? Came from David's body. The kingdom was finally at peace. Israel was probably the most powerful country on the planet under the, 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 the reign of King Solomon. He did build a house for God's name. Right, and God established the throne, but not forever. Because as we know, Solomon, even though God was like a father and a son, he did commit iniquity, didn't he? And God had to chasten him with a rod of iron, with a, yeah, the rod of iron and the stripes of the sons of men. Solomon had to be humbled. Solomon had to be punished by God. The kingdom was divided in Solomon's day. So while Solomon partially fulfilled this promise... And God was like a father to him. He looked after him and he was the king of peace. Because Solomon, Salem, Jerusalem is king of peace. Right? So while all these things were fulfilled, he did commit iniquity. And it wasn't established forever. So we know this chapter has a further, another application. And that's the thing with the Bible. There's Babylon in the days of Abraham. There's Babylon in the days of Daniel. Babylon in the days of Christ. And there's a Babylon that's arising in the days before Jesus Christ returned. Right? There are themes and ideas in the Bible that keep on coming up time and time again. There are prophecies that have a primary application, but they have another application. So the Bible is a book of ideas where some of these ideas repeat time and time again. So yes, Solomon would have looked at that and thought, that's me, that's me. But then he messed up, didn't he? And so the promise still stands, though, that there's going to be a son of David who is going to set up a kingdom and build a house in my name, and the throne of his kingdom is going to last forever. And he's going to be the son of God, and he's going to be the son of David. And I'm not going to leave him. My love will always stay with him. And your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. 
So even though Solomon messed up, God never, ever forsakes his promise. God's promise will always be fulfilled, regardless of who messes up in the interim. So when we put the two passages together of Luke and Samuel, we find as son of God and son of David, I will be his father and he will be my son. That I put the Chronicles reference in, but you can put the second of Samuel reference in. Luke 31:35, he'll be called the son of God. Samuel says he's going to come out of your bowels, right? Which is, you know, he's going to be your child, right? Your flesh and blood. And Jesus was the, the line of David, we know this, but he was going to have the throne of his father, David, right? I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever and ever. And Luke 1 verse 33 says he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. So you can see why this is a very important promise because when the angel Gabriel comes along to Mary and she says, you're the special mother, you are the mother, you're the one. And remember Mary, when she says her prayer, she quotes the prayer of another special mother that delivered Israel, which was Hannah. Because obviously she realised that finally... The seeds are going to come through her. Not that she had an easy life as a result of it. You know, she had a very hard life. Um, and of course, it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. So when did this kingdom start? Now, we always focus on the kingdom of God on earth. And the kingdom of God on earth clearly hasn't happened yet. The earth is very much subject to the kingdoms of men. Right? But when did the kingdom of God actually begin? Well, it's interesting because in the book of Matthew, we have this phrase, and it is unique to Matthew. It is called the kingdom of heaven, right? And when we look at Jesus' ministry and the ministry of John the Baptist, right, if you want to come across perhaps to Luke chapter 1, and you can look at the idea of when the kingdom began, and there's a few passages relating to this. So what did John the Baptist say? He comes to the wilderness of Judah, and he's saying the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. It's coming. And his message to Israel is, listen, the axe is going to be laid to the root of the tree. The Jewish system, the Jewish covenant, the law of Moses, the Jewish way of thinking was going to come to an end. A new covenant was going to be established. AD 70 is now only 40 years away. And John's message was very, very clear. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you are not having fruits worthy of repentance... You are going to be cast into the fire and everything's going to get destroyed with AD 70. All right? So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when the, the Pharisees came along and said, well, we're Abraham's children. Remember, he called them a generation of snakes. And he said, well, God can make stones into children of Abraham. Right? None of this counts. It is, it is your character. It is your values. It is your faith that what counts and so then Jesus comes along, and what does he say? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It means it's close, it's imminent, it's about to happen. Now, when I was a child, and, and the last one is the, the apostles, when they went into their preaching mission, and they went to Israel, and their message was, the kingdom of heaven is coming, it's at hand. And as a child, I always looked at it, and I thought, how can you say something's imminently coming when it's 2,000 years later and it still isn't here? Isn't that a little bit misleading appetising, that you're saying something's imminent, but it's not imminent? But this is where we've got to understand what the Bible means when it talks about the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to give you a little clue. When you go to Revelation, what descends out of heaven? Can anyone tell me? What descends out of heaven onto the earth with Christ? There's a new heavens and a new earth. There's a new creation. There's a new Jerusalem. There's a temple, right? So basically, all these things are actually getting prepared in heaven and essentially it comes down with Christ and it's on earth and the kingdoms of our Lord and this earth become the kingdom of our Lord. So when Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what he's saying is I'm about to ascend up to my Father to sit down on the right hand on his throne and the kingdom of heaven is going to begin. From that time onwards, there's going to be a new Jerusalem. There's going to be a temple. What's the temple made up of in the kingdom of heaven? Is it bricks in the kingdoms of heaven? What's the temple made of? 
Who's the chief cornerstone? Jesus. And who are the lively stones, the living stones in that temple? Us. So our job here is to be shaped and moulded into stones that when we die, our, our stone, if you like, is put into this temple that has Jesus as the chief cornerstone, and then all that's going to come down with Jesus on the earth. And our names are written, if you like. It's, it's got a, there's a stone with your name on it, <laughs> and it's being built as we speak. So in that sense, Jesus was going to ascend up into heaven. He was going to sit on the right hand of God. All power in heaven and earth was about to be given to him, but it wasn't a kingdom on earth. It was a kingdom in heaven. And that's the difference. Now, how close was that kingdom? When was that kingdom about to start? How long before Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father from this time? About three years. So in that sense, the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom on earth, was about to begin. And of course, when Jesus is raised from the dead, he says to his disciples in Matthew 28, all power on heaven and earth is given to me. And I'm about to send up to the right hand of my Father. Now, I think a lot of the times, and I, I'm very guilty of this when I was young and zealous, is that you, you end up getting so focused on not explaining heaven going and making sure people understand it's on earth, it's on earth, it's on earth, you realise you don't actually stop and go, well, what is the Bible saying when it says a kingdom of heaven? Is it talking about heaven going? When Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, because it only appears in Matthew, is it talking about living in heaven? And when you look at all the verses that talk about what the kingdom of heaven is like, in Matthew 13, if you want to turn there with me, there's a lot of parables that says the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, for those who have read this chapter, and you can turn there with me if you like, does it talk about the kingdom of heaven is like sitting in a cloud, playing a harp and singing pleasant songs with a perfect voice and little wings flapping around? Is that what he says? What is the kingdom of heaven like? If you're a member of the kingdom of heaven, what kind of things are you doing as a member of that kingdom? What are you doing? What does the parable say? Sorry? You're planting, exactly. You're harvesting. You're buying pearls of great price. Right? You're, you're looking around for something that's a treasure. Now, is that the kind of language, of the, is it the language of, of, of what we do now? So we are looking for the, the valuable treasure of the gospel, right? We are preaching right now, and we're hoping for a harvest in, in good ground, that the word will actually be scattered. So this is what the kingdom of heaven is like now. And if you're a member of the kingdom of heaven... This is the sort of things that you're doing. A man who sowed good seed in his field, like a grain of mustard seed. So when someone finds the truth, it starts as a little idea that is planted and then grows into something amazing that actually transforms that person into a new human being. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, a little tiny piece of mouldy bread. <laughs> you stick it in good bread, suddenly the bread all grows but that's really what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's a little thing that then grows. This is all the language of conversion, of preaching, of living in a new way of life now. It's what we do now. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so what Jesus is saying is, when I send you into all the world to preach, you are going to be citizens and ambassadors of that kingdom, and you are preaching what it is to be part of that kingdom. I want you to live a kingdom life. I want you to live a resurrected life. I want you to live like people who are part of God's kingdom now. That's what the kingdom of heaven means. It's not us floating up in the clouds. It's living the life of the kingdom. And it's sacrificing all, a treasure in a field. He goes and saves everything to buy that field so he can dig up that treasure a merchant in search of fine pearls, a net that's thrown into the sea, and a harvest that gathers in all these people. Right? So that's really what the Bible's talking about. So Jesus, when he ascended up into heaven, he sat down as a king, the kingdom of heaven commenced, and all these things start getting prepared. The temple, the new Jerusalem, all these things. Are, and where on earth 
building that and sending all these materials, like these lively stones up, so that when Jesus comes down, it all is ready to go. And of course, we have all these passages about Jesus as the king. Now, you can, I don't know how much room is in your margin, but in Luke chapter 2, one, you could probably put all the references of where Jesus is referred to as our king, right? You are the king of Israel, says Nathaniel, right? Um, the, the wise man said, where is he who was born to be king of the Jews? Right, and of course, John, when he comes into Jerusalem on the, um, the cult, the fall of Vass, fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah, they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And, they, and then old Pilate comes along and he goes, so, you are a king, aren't you? And Jesus says, well... Yes, to this end was I born, and for this purpose am I come into the world. So Jesus is a king, and he's here to testify of this truth. And, and what kind of power does Jesus have right now? Well, there's a number of passages we can refer to. I've picked out the best. But essentially, Ephesians chapter 1 says he's seated on the right hand in heavenly places. He's above everything. All rule, power, and authority, and dominion. It's almost like... Everything God did in the Old Testament period built up to Christ. And then when Christ comes, God says, well, you've now got the power. I'm going to give you autonomy. And we say with AD 70, that was Jesus that came at the head of the Roman armies. Well, it was in a way. Jesus now had, he's now sitting with God and he's making things happen as well. He's actually in charge of this whole process. He's put all things under his feet, giving, giving all authority, even the ecclesia. Acts chapter 4, we've read in our Sunday school lessons and our interested friends, the Jesus, that the apostles say to the priests, well, this stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, quoting out of um, the Old Testament, and there is salvation in no other name. There is no other name given under heaven or among men by which we are saved. That's it. it Jesus is really the way, the truth, and the life, John chapter 5. God doesn't judge anybody anymore, but judgment has been given to the Son. Right? And he says, whoever does not honour the Son is not honouring the Father who sent him. So I like what the interest of friends class has done because I've had a whole year on the life of Jesus. And now Jimmy's called the, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of Jesus. Because really, the comforter was Jesus' agent. In um, John 14 and John 16, Jesus makes it very clear that this, this angel, this, this person that's going to help you, this spirit of truth that's going to guide you in all these things, will not speak of his own back. Whatever I tell him, he will convey to you. It will be like me being there. So when Ananias and Sapphira died, that was Jesus' call that made that call. The Spirit of the Lord is, is often interchangeable for the Holy Spirit, which was essentially the Comforter, which was Jesus' direct agent. So in many ways, the Acts of the Apostles is the Acts of Christ through the Apostles, which is, I think, a very correct definition. John chapter 5. Uh, here we go. Yeah, we've covered that. So Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him, given him a name which above every name, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, he sat down on the right hand on the majesty of power, so much better than the angel, he's attained a more excellent name than what they have. And in verse 6 it says, let all the angels of God worship him. So Jesus is now reigning king in the kingdom of heaven, soon to be unveiled on earth when he returns. Now, what about our role? What is our role in this? We've, we mentioned a word. It starts with an A. What was that word? We are now what of the kingdom of God? It starts with an A. Am. B. B. S. Come on, children. Thank you. We are ambassadors of the... What does an ambassador do? Of another country. Can he vote in the country that he lives? No. He can't vote because he's a representative of another country. Does he have to follow the laws of that country? Yes, he does. 
right? If he breaks the law, should he be tried? Yes, he does. But he represents the interests of the country he comes from, right? He is an ambassador of another country. And so we are also ambassadors for Christ, says 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ. Now, if you want, we're going to come through to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, I think, is a very good chapter of the Bible to write these passages in if you're filling in your pre-loved Bibles because it talks about being strangers and pilgrims not being part of the countries they were in, but they were seeking another country. And I like that. It's one of my favourite verses. So I always have my verses around ambassadorship there because it's the one I think about. Whatever you think about for ambassadorship, you have all of these things here. Now, this is relevant from a um, conscientious objection point of view because it's not like we don't necessarily agree with going to war and fighting because God certainly encouraged people to go to war it says that God can be a man of war, right? God is a God of armies in sometimes in the Bible. So it's not that we're, we're pacifists who don't think war is needed in some senses, but it's just not our war. Jesus, when he said to Peter, when Peter's like, viva la revolution, cut off an ear, and then <laughs> the revolution stopped in its tracks. One ear, and that was the end of the revolution. <laughs> but he says, listen... If my servants really wanted to fight, they'd fight. But this is not the time to fight. I can call 12 legions of angels, Peter. Don't worry about firepower. I don't need your lousy sword. Everything's fine. right? I've got 12 legions. See? Boom. Now they're gone. Because this is not the time to fight. But the time will come when God will fight, and that's when we go to war. We do not fight in Australia's wars because we are not citizens of Australia. We are citizens, ambassadors of another kingdom the kingdom of God, and we are strangers and exiles. Now, come with me to Hebrews 11. I really like this passage. Hebrews 11 and verse 13. And it says, in Hebrews 11, verse 13, these all died in faith. They didn't receive the things promised. It's all going to come later. Abraham did not receive the land. Right? David has not seen his son. He's dead. This all happened after he died. They haven't received the promises. right? But they saw them a long way away. They had a vision. It's like David when he's sitting with the shepherd figuring out it's got to be Jerusalem. It's got to be Jerusalem. Because he's thinking about the Bible and God's grand plan and these golden threads and how it all works. right? And it says... And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And it says, For the people who speak thus make it very clear that they are seeking a homeland. I'm not home right now. Australia is not your home. We shouldn't feel like it's our home. We are so much a part of the kingdom of God, that's our homeland. It's like I live with a foreigner who comes from another homeland. And Aunt Iniola's very happy here, but when she goes back to her homeland, there is a certain glow about her, a certain smile about her. She is home. Sorry, but you're not home. I, I guess I'm sort of home. I'm her husband. But um, when she's home, it's very different. She, she is somewhere where she feels she belongs. She's in a homeland. That's how we should feel as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're part of God's kingdom, but we don't belong here. And we want to be somewhere else. We want to be home. And it says here in um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, you're no longer Australians and strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And then in Hebrews 11, 13, verse 12, it says that Jesus was actually, by the old covenant, the law of Moses, the Jews, the way they administer, he was kicked out the camp like a, like a dirty offering, basically showing that the old covenant rejected Jesus, the people who adhere to it. He says, let us then go out of this camp. He's talking to Jews to meet him and bear, bear the reproach for your jewel. We don't belong under the old covenant. We're part of the new covenant. And it says, because here we have no lasting city, we seek one that is to come. Now, what is the time? Oh, we're running out of time. And Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven and we await a saviour which is our Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't belong here. We are ambassadors of another kingdom. 
Now we'll just go through real quickly about the temple made up of people. We're first introduced this idea from Jesus in John, where he trashes the temple. As the high priest, he goes in, he inspects it, he finds it full of leprosy. They're all thieves and liars and crooks. So he, he cleans the place out. They're like, who's this man? He's bad for business. Right? And so he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up again. Because he knew they wanted to kill him. And they're like, how on earth could you do that? It took us 46 years to build this, and we still haven't finished. We heard you're a carpenter, but you're not that good. But it says in John, he was talking about his body, because he's the new temple. This other temple was going to get destroyed. The new temple was going to be Jesus, and he was going to be the chief cornerstone. And we are going to be living stones as part of this temple. So First Peter talks about this. And I, I would write this in John 2 if you wanted, because all the passages that talk about Jesus as a cornerstone and a living temple, it's an idea that's first introduced in John 2. So if you want to put these passages there, go for it. Otherwise, wherever you're comfortable, um, go for it. So Ephesians, it says, we are, um, we are part of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus being the cornerstone in whom a whole structure is fitted together into a holy temple in the Lord, built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God is going to live in the middle of us if we're all part of Christ. Okay, and here's some other passages. Um, no. Yeah, okay, sorry, that's the ones about the temple. Now, the New Jerusalem is another one, right? So, in the New Testament, we've got this idea of you've come in Hebrews chapter 12 to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it talks about the, the fathers, and he says they're desiring another city, a, a better country, a heavenly country. A country that's been built and prepared in heaven, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God because God is preparing for them a city, a new Jerusalem, which is going to come down out of heaven. And there's even a new spiritual Israel. We know in Galatians chapter 3, if you're baptised, you're heirs of the promises to Abraham, you're heirs of the promises to David, and you are offspring of Abraham you are now children of Abraham. You're part of Israel. You're spiritual Israel. And Paul contrasts Jews that believed in circumcision with the Jews that accepted Christ. And he says, these are not who are circumcised, do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But I'm not going to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Because circumcision doesn't count for anything, but there's a new creation coming, a new heaven, a new earth. It's all coming. And by those who walk by this rule, the new creation, the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, are called the Israel of God. Because they're like a spiritual children of Abraham, if you like. A spiritual seed. So where does this place us with regards to heaven going? Well, quite simply this. The kingdom of heaven is being built. Jesus is reigning as king over that kingdom. We are going to be delivered to that kingdom. Our names are written in the book of God. There's a lively stone with our name on it. There's a lively stone with Uncle Bruce's name on it. A very, very lively stone with Uncle Bruce's name on it. <laughs> right? But this is what's being prepared. And it's all going to be unveiled one day. In, in Colossians, I love it, it says... Um, set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. You've died and your life is hid with God in Christ. But when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So basically we're part of it, but then it will be all unveiled on the earth, the resurrection of the dead, and all of this amazing vision is going to take place. And we are dead in trespasses and sins, but when we are baptised, we're alive and we're raised up into heavenly places. Now, not literally, because we're here, but in our minds, we can be in a different place to what everybody else is and motivated by very different things in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age, he will show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. So, 
We have here the promises made to David, a kingdom. It's a kingdom that's being prepared in heaven. Jesus is going to be the king. He's going to sit on Abraham's, uh, on David's throne in the land that was promised to Abraham, but not quite yet. But at the moment, there's all this preparation going on. There's a temple that's being built. There's a new Jerusalem. There's a heavenly Mount Zion, a new creation. There's a new earth. It's all being prepared and in Revelation, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down from heaven. A holy city coming out from God. God is now dwelling with man and the former things are passed away. And won't it be nice when there is no more crying and tears? And in Revelation 21, verse 22, the temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. God is all and in all. And so really, that's our big idea. Brothers, sisters and young people, a golden thread, a kingdom that's being prepared right from the foundation of the world. And as Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. And Hebrews 11, all of these people died, including our dear Uncle Bruce, didn't receive the promises because God has provided a better thing for us, a better thing for us that these people without us are not going to be made perfect. And isn't that something to strive for? And in these last evil days, hang together, keep our minds in heavenly places, see the folly of the world and what it is, and, and, and just make sure we're focused on that prize. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.